Want to learn how to be a master of business without going back to school? Listen to the Planet Money MBA. No suits, no PowerPoints, just the secrets of business school delivered straight to your ears. Every Wednesday till Labor Day on Planet Money from NPR. Support for Back from Broken comes from Soberlink. Alcohol addiction comes with many challenges, but one of the most difficult hurdles is regaining the trust of those closest to you. Learn about a way to show proof of your commitment to sobriety at Soberlink.com slash BFB. Hey, it's Vic. Just want to let you know this episode contains some strong language, so please be advised. In three, two, one. When I was a kid, I was a lot for my parents to handle. I mean, all kids have their moments, right? But when you add drugs and alcohol, I would always make things interesting, that's for sure. Like this one time, I was about 16 and I'd been out partying all night. I passed out near a river and when I woke up the next morning, I was sore and bloodied and realized I had gotten into a fight. I don't remember any of it, and I was still drunk when I awoke. And who was left to deal with me? My mom and dad. I know that my drug addiction was really hard on them. And you know, there's lots of other parents out there who can relate to seeing their kids suffer. Stephen Fisher is one of them. As parents, we all have those moments where we wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat, thinking of how we screwed up our kids. I think, I don't know if any parent I've ever talked to who has not had some of those moments. And they get all of our dysfunction, but they get our good parts too. And I have to say, this journey has been, it hasn't been easy, but it's been absolutely beautiful. And I wouldn't trade it for the world, but we've earned it the hard way. We've had to go through hell and back to really get to a better place today. Stephen and his wife are therapists. And while they often would help other families work through their issues, Their own son, Matt, was struggling with drugs and alcohol as a teenager. Matt felt that getting drunk and high helped him control his mood swings. I think it was like trying to self-soothe and I was like, you know, I don't don't want to be like so angry anymore and I don't want to feel so out of control. Addiction really is a family disease. It affects everyone in the household. And if you're a parent or a child struggling with addiction and destructive behavior, Maybe you'll hear your own family story in The Fishers. Today, we're going to hear from Stephen and Matt Fisher about the ways Matt's struggles really impacted their family, how Matt found help, and the ways they're now working to help other families who struggle. I'm Vic Vela. I'm a journalist, a storyteller, and a recovering drug addict. And this is Back From Broken from Colorado Public Radio. Stories about the highest highs, the darkest moments, and what it takes to make a comeback. Stephen and his wife Liz welcomed their first son Matthew into the world in the early 90s. When he came out as a baby, his energy was so bright and so intense, always asking questions, always wanting to know the truth, never settling for less. And then when he was about two years old, his brothers, his twin brothers were born, and he got knocked off the throne really hard, and he was really pissed off about that. And then we had all the sibling rivalry, and this just kind of morphed into more and more anger and hurt and feeling left out over the years. And then that intensity kind of took a darker turn, and then we had to sort through all that kind of stuff. Matt, thinking back, you know, your, your dad said you were a smart kid, lots of questions. When you think back on being a little kid, is there a particular memory that stands out around that period? We moved from Mississippi to Colorado when I was five. So I think like growing up in Mississippi, you know, it's like we had our family around us. We were always had our grandparents and just a lot of support. And I think moving out here, you know, I kind of like lost my best friend. And then my, you know, I, I always kind of struggled to meet new people. My brothers were very social. Yeah, moving out here was just very dysregulating. And, um, you know, I, I made, you know, some good friends out here as, you know, in like kindergarten, first grade. But yeah, I was always just kind of like this, oh, like, you know, I, I don't really belong here. And, um, you know, kind of contrasting that with my very social brothers. So I just felt like kind of an outcast. That's <laughs> tough for a kid. Yeah. Yeah. That isolation weighed heavily on Matt. And as he got older, it was hard for him to understand why he couldn't fit in. 
He liked the same things other kids did, like fire trucks and Hot Wheels, but he had a lot of mood swings and anger, especially when puberty hit. There was one day when his temper really boiled over. So Matthew was about 12 or 13, and this is when he really started to feel the pinch of that teenage years and that emotion, that anger, and that hurt of feeling left out with his brothers kind of got worse. And so I was doing a grand opening of my counseling office, and Matthew and his brothers were playing in the parking lot with and with another friend. You know, it was like one of my one of my best friends would like always uh, come over for school, and I was um, at this point in my life, I was frankly just kind of a dick, kind of like slowly losing everyone around me, and kind of the point where like you know that frankly you know they didn't want to hang out with me i think that was looking back you're reasonable for the way i was acting mm-hmm. but i i think in the moment i was just like seeing them as like kind of stealing my best friend and um like feeling really lonely and and um yeah there's this whole thing of like oh they're getting all the attention and i'm like kind of left on my own so it just kind of built up yeah i just kind of had this moment where i threw my brother off the bike and um just kind of this it just felt really uncontrollable and Impulsive, and I, you know, I definitely had a lot of mood mood issues going on, and um, just would kind of have to go into these like really, really uncontrollable rages. And this is again during the grand opening of my counseling thing, so I'm sure everybody's looking at the counselor like, "What's your kid doing beating up your other kid?" Yeah. And right across the parking, my wife's boss was walking across the parking lot to our grand opening and saw it all happen and broke it up. I think like after it happened, then I ran home and I just started crying, and it was like I didn't. I felt really bad about it and I was Mm -hmm. like, you know, I didn't want to hurt my brother and it was just like feeling out of control. And, um, yeah, I remember like kind of my parents coming home and like about to yell at me and then I just started crying and, uh, yeah. So I think the biggest thing was like just feeling angry and out of control and like kind of scared of what I like not being able to control my actions. Oh gosh. And as parents, it was hard for us because math, one of Matthew's core wounds or core emotional issues was, feeling abandoned, feeling alone, feeling left out. And we, Liz and I just knew, we just knew that that was pounded his core issues really hard and how much he was hurting that caused him to act out like that. And so we were feeling for him, even though we were also feeling for our other son who had just gotten beat up and was really traumatized as well. So we were trying to be there for both of them. That was a hard moment. And, and Matt, I got to say, like, I I had a lot of behavioral problems when I was young, too. Like, going back to kindergarten, mouthing off to the teacher and getting kicked out of the class. Like, the principal's office had, like, a wing dedicated to me. Like, it was just like I was bad. <laughs> and I can relate right. to that rage, that yeah. rage where you were just like the Incredible Hulk. But then that um, that the worst feeling in the world is that remorse when it settles in because you knew – gosh, if I could just go back and, and do it over again, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think about that a lot. Well, I, and Stephen, you are still a human being. You're still mm-hmm. human. Yep. And humans still react in ways. And, and, and so I got, I got to ask, like, this was a big day for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you had to have been pissed off. Well, therapists are people too. And I think more than pissed off, I was probably feeling shame mm. that all of my family dysfunction was exposed to the public, but also yeah. just the fact that feeling like as a dad, what could I have done differently so we didn't get to that position in the first place? Matt knew he was way out of control that day, and he was tired of feeling so angry all the time. So when his neighbor introduced him to marijuana when he was in middle school, Matt loved the way it made him feel. It did give me a feeling of like being more in control. Mm. And then one kid was selling like Oxycontin on the school bus in seventh grade. And so we, you know, I kind of, like, I think, I think just as I, as I started like, you know, developing this reputation and a lot of my friends, parents were telling me like, oh, like, you know, you can't hang out with this kid. I started hanging out with, uh, you know, just like a rougher crowd. And, you know, I remember summer into eighth grade, I was just like hanging out with this you know, these two girls and the, my, my friend's older brother that were just using a lot and, you know, it was like, just spent the whole summer getting really fucked up and, yeah, doing a lot of painkillers and drinking a lot and smoking a lot. You know, my, my dad actually found me drunk, like, passed out on this trail by our house. That was a hard moment. Yeah, they were like, oh, shit, like, this is kind of a little out of control. Walk me through that, that, that day where your dad found you. 
Yeah, I, I was. I got really drunk. Like we kind of were were pre drinking at a friend's house, and then there was like this spot in the woods, called the couch. Like all the cool kids were hanging out there, and there were some older, older, like kind of more like twenty somethings. I thought were really cool, but they were kind of like these burnouts that worked at you know like we're just kind of selling drugs and cigarettes to kids and high schoolers. Um, so that was kind of like a big deal for me of like getting invited to this like party in the woods. But yeah, I like had too much to drink and, um, just kind of passed out. And like, I remember like one kid put a cigarette on me and they're just kind of laughing that I was like all fucked up Mm. and, uh, they just kind of left me there. You know, here I am like having a good time with all these people and feeling kind of like accepted. I'm in the, I'm cool. And, then everyone just uh, kind of left, you know, and I'm just like, I can't even like get up and I'm like throwing up on the ground. And I was, it was like, oh shit, where'd everyone go? And, um, yeah, yeah. Just feeling really, really like abandoned and like kind of all these, these new friends that I thought I'd made. I was, I was just like, oh, like, I guess they didn't really care about me. That's hard. Steven, that's gotta be, I mean, you, you your son is passed out in the woods. Like, what do you remember about that? Well, we knew there was something going on that day and I was looking for him. I was looking all over town and I'd heard about this spot in the woods and I went back there before. And, and so I, I decided to go back there again because I figured they're probably back there and I was going back there for the second or third time this time. And sure enough, there he was just passed out. It was a Saturday morning, right on the trail beside the woods, about, you know, a hundred yards off the, off the field. And, um, I was just feeling really heartbroken. Mm. I was feeling so heartbroken that it come to this. And I remember Matthew's packed pats out, and I just I picked him up, and I carried him home. And I put him in his bed, and I just let him sleep it off. And I was just feeling so broken. And I was feeling like, what? How have I contributed to getting here? What is, what is my responsibility for contributing to this and how has we have a family gotten here and i just felt heartbroken for my son because in my eyes matthew's not this angry aggressive stoner that's scaring other kids he's this little two-year-old boy with so much joy in him that's the matthew i've always known and in those moments all i saw was this two-year-old kid with such joy and I'm just, I was just thinking, where did that go? Yeah. And then we got through that moment and we went on, but it was, um, yeah, that was a hard day. That was a hard day. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, Stephen. I mean, you're the dad. This is your boy, you know? Yeah. And I'm also feeling like I've, I've really screwed him up. Why would you feel that? Because, I mean, we did with, and we're honestly, Liz and I were good parents. We were great parents, but we weren't perfect. There are no perfect parents. We have our share of character defects and our mistakes. We're working on it. But really looking at my own character defects and my own issues that have contributed to the problem. And that's what I want to say to all families and parents out there is instead of playing the blame game, we all want to look at our own part, not to blame ourselves or criticize ourselves, but to own accountability and to learn how to forgive ourselves and forgive our kids because our character defects don't ultimately define us. They are, they're patterns that we're stuck in, but if we want to do our own inner work, we can break free of those patterns. And this whole process between Matthew and I, Matthew's struggles was a wake-up call for us to have as a family to really look at our own issues and to really heal and get better as a family. So our healing process wasn't just Matthew, it was all of us. It was me and Liz and our other sons growing and getting better and releasing our own shame and our own hurt. And that's ultimately what it's come down to over the years. And those moments don't ultimately define us. I think that was the lesson for me. Stephen and his wife, Liz, couldn't figure out how to help Matt. He was still using drugs a lot. And when he was in eighth grade, he even got arrested at school for beating up another kid. When they were at one of Matt's probation hearings, Stephen decided it was time to lay down the law. We were sitting about to go into court one day, and one of his conditions of probation was uh, he couldn't smoke any pot. And I know he had, but he'd he'd passed the UAs, so I know he'd gotten away with it. And so we're sitting in that little room before we go into court, and our lawyer's sitting there, and I said, Matthew, you need to tell the judge the truth. You need to be honest with her. And my lawyer said, Steve, don't do it. (laughs) I said, 
I said, no, I got to. I'm sorry. I, I got to. I said, Matthew, you can tell the judge or I'm going to. And he did. But he said he didn't trust me after that. He didn't trust me for a couple of years after that. So you told the judge that he had pot? Well, I said either he has to do yeah, that he smoked pot while he was on probation, breaking the conditions of his court probation. And, and so I said, either you tell her or I'm going to. And so he did tell her. I wanted it to come from him. And, uh, and he got some consequences out of it, but it wasn't the end of the world. Mm-hmm. But that kind of stubbornness that sometimes maybe I come on a little too strong. Maybe I'm not strong enough. It's just a, it's a hard line to walk. I'm doing the best I can. Yeah, finding that balance as a dad, yeah. you know? Yeah. Gosh. Matt, how did you feel? Did, did you understand why your dad did this? I, yeah, no, I, I do now. <laughs> I do now. I mean, I and I think you know, in the back of my mind, I, I got it. But I was just so pissed off and like scared and like, you know, made me want to like hide stuff more. Yeah. So Matt continued to drink and use drugs for years after that, until one night he finally had his wake up call. I'll tell you all about it after this break. Support for Back From Broken comes from the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, committed to creating endless possibilities for medical discoveries. Learn more at possibilities-endless.com. Hey, it's Vic. I really appreciate you being a Back From Broken listener. It means a lot. Now, can you do me a favor? Can you take a moment to find Back From Broken on whatever podcast app you use, like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and give us a like, a rating, and even a review? If you think what we're doing matters, if you think it's important to talk about recovery with compassion and hope, all you got to do to help spread the word is like, rate, or review this podcast. It really does help other people find Back From Broken. Thanks for listening. And thanks for supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio. One night when he was 18, Matt took LSD with some friends. But he was having a really bad trip. His friends took his keys and Matt left without a coat or shoes in the middle of winter. He ended up sitting inside his freezing car all alone, he was trying to figure out who to call for help. Yeah, I remember like going through my phone, just like tripping and uh, she's like, I don't have anybody, you know, like I don't, I can't really count on any of these people. I don't, you know, I don't trust any of these people. And uh, yeah, just, just feeling like I, I had been given this amazing gift of, of life and of just family and, and love. And then I'd really squandered it. Yeah, it was just a sense that I, I just kind of ruined that. And I, I had mm. pushed everyone away and I didn't have anyone and coming down and being like, I fucked up here. I have nothing. Finally, Matt decided to call his parents. And so me and my wife Liz are driving across town. Liz is on the phone with him, and he's trying, in his state of mind, he's trying to give us directions to where he is. And we're, by some lucky chance, I was driving. She, Liz is telling me which direction to go. And about 30 minutes later, we pulled in the parking lot of some apartment complex in Aurora. And we, and we pulled up, and there was his car. And he was sitting in it. And it was so pitiful because he had a light t-shirt on, no shoes, sitting in the driver's seat of his car, just shivering, just absolutely shivering in the snow out there. And I remember we pulled up beside him, he looked over at us, the look of relief on his face was like, oh my God, thank God you're here. (laughs) And we got him in the car and we gave him a big hug and Liz drove his car home and I was driving him home. And on the way home, He kept on saying to me, he said, Dad, the love is all gone. Where did it go? Where did it go? Of course, he's tripping hard. He is tripping hard. And and it's not a good experience. And, And I said, Matthew, the love is right here. It never left. Wow. That's the space that Liz and I always held for Matthew is that the love is always here. It never left. Even if you don't see it in the current moment, it's still here. We are still here. We love you. You're a beautiful, beautiful person, even if you don't see that right now. 
And that's the space we're always holding for him. Even when he couldn't hold that for himself. I mean, how powerful. Matt, what, what did you mean when you said, I lost the love? I feel like as a, as a kid, I just, I had this really profound sense of like love and connection and like, just, yeah, just feeling like I had this, all these supportive people around me. And I, I think I always was very empathetic and I always really cared about other people. Like my dad likes to tell the story of like when I, uh, when I, you know, they're reading like uh, Christmas Carol when I'm like five or six and it gets to the part about Tiny Tim and he can't go to the doctor. I'm like, well, why can't he go to the doctor for free? Oh. You know, and I, I think I, I, and I really love my brothers too, kind of, even though I was angry at them and, and all, you know, all these people and uh, kind of like the, not terribly religious, but the prodigal son kind of story. That's what, that's kind of what I felt, you know, seeing my dad. And so we, we got him home and it's about three o'clock in the morning by this point. And we made this pallet with blankets on the floor by our bed because we just didn't want him to go anywhere because we're just, he was still tripping hard and we're just scared for him. Sure. And he was really in a really dark place. And I woke up a couple hours later, it's probably about three thirty, four o'clock. I woke up and he's gone. And I just freaked. I said, Liz, where do you? I, mean, I was freaking out. And so we looked frantically for him everywhere and we found him across the street in a park. He was meditating under a tree. And so he's in a better place by this point and he has a little bit better experience. So I was like, okay, this is better. And, uh, but we still brought him home. And, uh, and we took care of him. And for the next month, he was in such a dark, dark, dark place. Me and Liz were both really scared for him. And we just kind of nurtured him back to health. He couldn't go to school. He couldn't work. He couldn't do anything for the next month. We just kind of nurtured him back to health. And then he finally got on his way. But I think, Matthew, I think that was rock bottom for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was a really big turning point. I was experiencing like psychosis. So I, like, I remember I had work the next day. I was working at this coffee shop and everything was too loud. And I, I was like done with the acid at this point. And, uh, you know, everything. But it, it wasn't done with you. Yeah. yeah I, I went up to my boss. I was like, I can't, I can't work today. <laughs> and I think I actually told her that I, I had had a bad, I, I was like, yeah, I just did some acid. Like I just was not <laughs> coherent. <laughs> She was really sweet about it. She was like, I didn't get fired. I think she just told me to go home. I, I'm sure she appreciated the the honesty. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, it was about two, one, a month and a half or two months, but I, I, I couldn't work yeah. at my parents' house. You know, it was, I remember even like first week or two, like I was hard to walk my dog around the, the block. I had heard about, you know, LSD induced schizophrenia or psychosis. And uh, we'd, we'd had some, you know, I've definitely had some family history of schizophrenia so i was just like i have schizophrenia now okay <laughs> gosh yeah it was just really scary just having all these thoughts of like oh like i'm just like i'm never going to be able to to go to college or like fall in love really just feeling like i've messed up my life it took matt about a month to come out of the psychosis he was experiencing He spent most days laying on his parents' couch because that was really all he could do. Slowly but surely, though, he started to feel like himself again. He was keeping a journal and eating better. And he turned to something that's becoming more and more popular for folks in recovery that some studies say can make a big difference for people trying to kick a drug habit. I think I started watching uh, yoga on TV. <laughs> they had like a, a, a subscription to Guy Am. It was like a, they do a lot of yoga and meditation. So I started watching this guy named Rodney Yee doing yoga. And oh. I just <laughs> started meditating and doing yoga. And that was kind of, it just was like, oh, like I, I feel pretty good doing this. And, uh, you know, it was like a really, this guy had like a great relaxing voice and kind of this whole guided experience. And I was just like, kind of for the first time in a long time, just doing something that just, for the sake of doing it and like feeling good about it. I'd always been really interested in neuroscience and and, uh, psychology. So I started getting books on like neuroscience and addiction and depression and like um, just really trying to understand like, why am I feeling like this? Like, why am I feeling the need to use? Like, and how do I just start to feel better about myself? Like sober. Mm -hmm. So now now you're in it, You're, you're digging this stuff. Yeah. After everything, kind of the torture that you put yourself through, right, you know, in your own life, and now you have something that's really helpful and soothing and, and I guess, calming, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Did yoga help with the mood swings? Yeah, it did. I th- I was like, at this point, I, I, I think I still had some mood swings and mania, but I was just more like numb. And I think, I think a lot of me like had really tamped down a lot of that anger and just kind of got into the state of like, I'm just dissociated and like kind of numb. Um, so it more felt like it was bringing me like out of that, like, okay, like I can start to feel again. And, and, um, dad, I don't know if you noticed me like having like mood swings. I think there were some times where I'd go off and you were mom or stuff. But I think after that, I didn't have like as much. No, that started to go away at that point. Yeah. I mean, so when, when Matthew was 12, he was diagnosed with a mood disorder and the mood swings are always there. But at that point in time, that's when it really started to go down. You really started to level out, but you had to work at it. You had to get your sleep. You took your exercise seriously. You took your self-care seriously. We saw you reading all these books. I'd see all these book titles of healing depression and all, you know, and mood disorder and how to, you know, win friends and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's all these books you're reading all the time. That was a real turning point for you. Stephen, let me ask you, since you're the expert really on this, a, a mood disorder, I know that's, that's, we hear that, you know, but I guess explain to other parents out there what that looks like uh, sure. when you have a child with, with a mood disorder. So mood disorder is high impulsivity and low frustration tolerance, where you're more impulsive and you have a lower tolerance for any d- difficult situations, much easier to pop off, lose your cool, and more so than most people. Um, so that's High impulsivity, low frustration tolerance is basically all about what a mood disorder is. And Matthew had all those hallmarks. Yeah. And so we had that diagnosis and we tried different medications, but none of that really was made a big difference. It really wasn't the solution. We really had to go through our own process. Well, and I got to tell you, you described me perfectly. And it's one of the reasons why I do this yeah. show. And let me explain because I, I you know... Boy, we've, we, there's so many hurdles in terms of access to mental health to begin with, okay? Right. Much less 20 plus 30 years ago, right, right in small right. town Colorado, much less growing up in a Mexican-American family where culturally right. mental health is going to see a, a, a counselor is not something that's in part of the culture. Like that's something right. wasps do, right? Right, right. And uh, so I more than likely had an undiagnosed mood disorder because I had the exact same things that right. Matt went through. You know, the blow-ups, feeling persecuted by authority and kind of like telling them to right. F off. But then I also am totally honest. I never tell a lie because right. I'm just brutally honest. So many of us have these issues and we, you know, and it's it's so hard for kids and for 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 parents to have to deal with that, right? Right. Right. But there's such a gift too, and if you can work on the downside of it, the upside of that gift is amazing. I mean, Matthew is an amazing human being who's who's really coming into his power and just living his truth. And he's not afraid to be himself authentically, but he's now he's kind about it. And now he's considerate of others' feelings, whereas before that was the part he was missing. But he's still kept that authenticity, which I just admire so much about him. So the good can exist without the bad. Absolutely. It's almost like all those experiences just kind of burned away some of the character defects so he could just, the purity of who he's always been and who I remember him as as a two-year-old and that joy that he has, he still has it. He didn't lose it. Yeah. And Matthew started really coming around. He he started. He was really apologizing to his brothers for how horrible of an older brother he'd been. And at this point, his younger brothers, my twins, were two years younger than them. They said, "Screw you, dude! You've been horrible to us all these years, and now you're getting healthy on me. Well, screw you!" And it took them like a couple years to finally forgive him. But but Matthew was very patient. He took accountability over and over and over again. One of my twins was talking about Stockholm syndrome for a while because he was just so scared of his older brother. You know, he just had to kind of kiss up to him so he wouldn't get get hurt. Oh no, gosh! And one time, I remember hearing one of my twins, Craig, say, "Matthew, I know that you're better, and I know that you've come a long way, but when you try to come hug me, I still flinch." Because he died, I don't know what's coming. And there was a couple of years where that whole period of transition, but Matthew was just a rock star. He was really accountable. He was really kind. He was consistently gentle and apologetic. And that brought him around. It took him a couple of years, but that brought him around. And then this is a few years ago. One of my other sons is now working at a rehab center too. And he said, out of all the people, he's seen a lot of people in rehab. He says he's never seen anybody turn it around so dramatically in such a short period of time as Matthew did. 
because Matthew really did his own work to turn this around because he really wanted to change. He was at the point where he wanted it. He said, this is enough. I got to do something. You got to be willing. Yeah. Yeah. The willingness has got to be there. I think that's a really good example of how the healing and recovery is not limited to the person with the problem. The whole family is impacted and they have to heal all together. We have our own issues and we had our own you know, family lineage and we have our own stuff and we had to work on our own stuff. So yes, it is a family issue and we've all had to work on our communication and our own emotions and our own, how do we... How do we have conflict resolution in a healthy way? And how do we have healthy boundaries? But how do we, all that stuff that you have to learn, but do it without, have healthy boundaries without being a jerk about it. And all that's, we've all, we've all had to work on that together. It wasn't easy, but Matt and his family put in a lot of work together to overcome the issues they had faced in the past. While he was mending relationships and really starting to take care of himself, Matt was also thinking about what he was going to do next. After getting a college degree in outdoor education, he started working in rehab settings as a wilderness therapist and in more traditional centers. Matt started writing blog posts about his experiences, and in reading some of them, Stephen asked his son if he wanted to write a book together. And I talked to him. He's like, yeah, let's do it. And it's been a huge part of our own healing journey to be able to talk about it and to process it. And I think that our story has a lot to offer other families because so many families, we all have these stories, but we're all so embarrassed and ashamed to tell the stories because they're embarrassing. Yeah. And just being able to tell these stories and know that these, this character defects and this dysfunction does not define us. What it is to be human is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. And working through these character defects, you just get the gold that's underneath. So we can talk about the stories and realize that the stories don't ultimately define us. And that's been a real big part of our healing process. Matt, what have you learned about your relationship with your father throughout this process? I, I think just how reliable my dad is. Like, he's very stubborn, and we, we butted heads a lot. But I, I I really appreciate just how, like, genuine and honest he is. And it's always been like we've been able to, to talk about and work through things. And um, I really can't imagine what it was like kind of, like, raising, you know, a kid like like me. And, um, sure, you know, I, I think that, that I'm definitely able to be where I'm at today because of him and, and my mom, you know. And um, you know, I work with a lot of people without that kind of support. And I kind of know where all these things can spiral down to. And I'm just I'm really grateful to have had that safety net. Stephen, what advice do you have for families, dads, moms, who have their sons or daughters are struggling with mental health issues, uh, substance abuse issues, because that father-son relationship is so complicated. Right. You know, it's obviously, it could be very strong. It could be very emotional, even in the perfect situation. Right. And then you add these other things that you dealt with 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 Matt. What kinds of uh, advice do you have there? Right. So there's no one size fits all. You have to look at your own situation and do what you feel is right. And there's no right or wrong answer a lot of times. You just do the best you can. But through it all, the main thing is to remember your love for your kid. And are you coming from your own issues or your own defensiveness or your own emotional triggers? Or are you sorting through that and trying to keep the love for your kid in sight? And are you doing whatever you do, whether it's boundaries or you're, you're trying to nurture them or let them let off the hook or you're, whatever you're doing, are you doing it because of your love for your kid or are you doing it because you're emotionally triggered and you're, and you're defensive and you're upset? Always try to look at your own motivations and come from that place. Mm. Yeah, I, I talk with a fair amount of parents and do some volunteer work with teens in recovery. Um, and that's, that's a hard line of like, you know, where, when do I bring down the hammer on the kid and when... When do I really try to um, to maintain that open communication and honesty? And uh, it it can be hard because, you know, you can either be too permissive and let these behaviors continue or you can alienate your kid. Um, so that's I don't think there's any easy answers. And, you know, I think looking back, I, you know, I think I think my parents, um, you know, just were trying to make the best decisions they could, you know, in some really tough circumstances. Well, thank you for that. And man, I'll, I'll give you the last word. What advice do you have for people, especially young people, right? Especially kids, teens, young adults who are struggling with some of the things that you struggle with. 
Yeah, don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really easy when you're wrapped up in being a teenager and and uh, friends, and it, it just seems like the whole world, like this is the world, and you know nothing's ever going to be different. I know it sounds cheesy, but like that is just such a small part of your life. Yeah, and you're going to meet other people, and and I tell a lot of folks in treatment and recovery is like it's okay to be by yourself it's okay to disappoint people and, and I think a lot of like my decisions came from like being afraid of being alone or not being okay with myself and I think really yeah, you know, if you want to have healthy relationships if you want to make good decisions like having a sense of self a strong sense of self and, and, and self-respect and self-love and like yeah just being okay to to be the odd man out and I always felt like kind of awkward, you know, as college too, of just being like, hey, like, I don't want to smoke. And it was like hard to say no. I was like, I want to belong. I want to be cool. And it was like just this moment. But yeah, I think in recovery, like you're going to have so many of those moments and you just have to be like, I I need to put myself first. Yeah, I need to know that I, I will get through this. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Stephen and Matthew Fisher's book is called Light Shines Through the Broken Pieces. Learn more about the book at fishertransformation.com. Back from Broken is a show about how we're all broken sometimes and how we need help from time to time. If you're struggling with addiction or mental health issues, you can find a list of resources at our website, backfrombroken.org. Thanks for listening to Back From Broken. Please review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps other people find it. Back From Broken is hosted by me, Vic Vela. It's a production of Colorado Public Radio's Audio Innovation Studio and CPR News. Our lead producer today was Rebecca Romberg. Find a list of all the folks who worked hard to make this episode in the show notes. This podcast is made possible by Colorado Public Radio members Learn about supporting Back From Broken at CPR.org.